When I first was in the business, I used to assume that everybody knew a lot more than I did. They were educated, they had have experience and everything, and so I just assumed if they said X, X was probably the case. It took me a little while, but not too long to figure out they didn't know any more than I did. Well, the different answers to that question, I used to work for somebody named Roy Neuberger, uh, New, who founded Neuberger Berman back in the 30s. And Roy Neuberger was an astonishing trader. He would be sitting there reading the Wall Street Journal, and he would say to me, there's 100,000 shares of IBM on the floor, uh, or bid 90 and an eighth. I would say, what the hell is he talking about? So we'd go to the floor, and sure enough, there's 100,000 shares of IBM for sale. I don't know how he did it, he just, he had a sense of watching that they had the tape in those days, you know, he just had this unbelievable sense of timing and trading. He was a remarkable trader. Now I'm horrible. I am. He might have been the best trader I ever saw. Uh, Mike Steinhardt's another great trader. Some great, great old traders in in the in the business. If you're going to if you're going to be a contrarian investor, which you know you've been very successful at, uh, and you've had some some epically great calls. Um, you know, I was in Asia when you started talking about mainland China, when, you know, even living in Hong Kong, no one thought there was a future for it. So it's, uh, you've got a record to prove it could be done. But for an, I think for an awful lot of investors, both professional and, and, and people who are you know, doing it with their own money, it's incredibly hard to, to, end, to end up with a level of conviction that allows you to be a contrarian investor. I mean, how do you develop that level of conviction? Well, first of all, yes, you use the term contrarian, and, and by definition, I guess that's right. I never thought of myself that way. A contrarian would just say, they're all buying X, I'm going to sell X. That's not, that's not what I do. You're an independent investor. Right, that's a better way. That's what I like that. That's why I'm trying to teach my girls to think independently, to, uh, to be curious. First of all, to be curious, to go and look at that thing that nobody's looking at, and then to think independently and say, they all say this is terrible, but I know goes into my brain and I spin it around and it comes out that I know this is going to be good in the end. When I first was in the business, I used to assume that everybody knew a lot more than I did. They were educated, they had experience and everything. And so I just assumed if they said X, X was probably the case. It took me a little while, but not too long to figure out they didn't know any more than I did, you know. In fact, they might know less than I did, even though they were experienced and knowledgeable and well-educated. So I guess that came uh, from experience. I was insecure like everybody else, but it came from, from experience that, hey, when I see something like this, it's often right. You know, maybe I, maybe I should do more and more of this. And, and I learned that from experience. Don't think I didn't make plenty of mistakes along the way. Uh, I mean, I was just thinking one of my great mistakes along the way, uh, but that built up my confidence. Well, what so, would, for the well, that sake was, of the, Okay, uh, oh. back in, it was a time when the market, everybody was bullish, I became bearish. I put all my money into puts, and lo and behold, six months later, I had tripled my money, and everybody else, I mean, it was really a massive bear market, and everybody else was losing their shirt. I became, and, and on the day of the bottom, I sold my puts. I mean, I'm bad timing, this was pure co uh, luck. Um, and I said, okay, I'll wait for the market to rally, and then I'm gonna sell short. I don't wanna pay the premium this time at buying the puts. So I uh, waited for the market to rally, and it did rally. And I said, so for two, two months later, I waited, and I sold everything I had in six stocks. So short, six stocks. Well, two months later, I was, wiped out. I'd lost everything. But the main moral of that story is within two years, all six of those companies had gone bankrupt, right. literally bankrupt. I mean, I knew what I was doing. So it's a sizing issue or is it a timing issue? Well, in that case, it was a timing issue. I told you I'm the worst trader in the whole world. <laughs> I can yeah. prove it many, many, many times. You know, literally within two years, they were all bankrupt, but I went broke first because but how of my do you, time. How, Jim, how do you know that the difference between being early and being wrong, because you know, uh, you teach me that. Okay, I'd like to know. I'm still trying well, to learn. I really don't know either. I mean, you know, one of the, I mean, one of the things that that has, uh, 
you're confounded, I think, a lot of us in this, in this recent unprecedented rally. I mean, it's not unprecedented in history, but the sort of things that have gone up and, and the level of volatility we've had has been unprecedented. I mean, the only period that I can compare it to would be the late 90s, um, where just everything in, uh, in a certain area went up. Now it looks like, you know, it's almost, it's, in, at least in the States, it's almost everything across the board. And there have been plenty of people who've wanted to short the fangs, um, to short some of the tech stocks, to short some of these very expensive blue chips. And, you know, they've been, they've been very badly punished. And, and, and in the case of, even in the case of uh, very good mutual fund investors, you know, people with tremendous track records like Grant and Mayo, who have moved to a higher cash position, they've seen massive redemptions because people, you know, their own investors don't seem inclined to stick around and see how it plays out. So, you know, both on a personal and a professional level, being early seems to be, you know, incredibly painful and destructive to your business. So, sure, you know, yeah. if you've got a conviction, um, you know, what do you do? Do you, do you, do you wait for a, um, a, a change in momentum? Do you, do you use moving averages, which is something that I, I know people have used, and I've used something myself, which is to wait until the five and the 20 day, uh, you know, diverge, and that gives you your signal that momentum's coming out of a trade? Um, or, or, or do you just need to size it to a degree which you can, you can be persistent? Well, I usually, since I know I'm always early, I make a decision and then wait. <laughs> and then just make myself wait a month, six months, whatever it happens to be, and I'm still too early. I'm still too early nearly always because I make the decision too soon. I realize so maybe I better start making the decision later uh, in life. Uh, sometimes you just have to throw in the towel, I mean, especially on the short side. Right. You have no choice. If they're just racing against you all the time, you can sit there and meet the margin calls all day long. But one of the old adages is never meet a margin call which you may have heard from, from old-time traders. You know, if you get a margin call, just don't meet it because that means something is very seriously wrong. Right, that's your stop loss. That's, that's a, yeah, well, <laughs> stop losses are usually before a margin call comes. Uh, but I want to go back to something you said. The, you, you're, you're not uh, as experienced as I am, obviously, because you're not as old as I am, is, is what I'm saying. Um, but I remember in the early 70s, there was something called the Nifty 50, uh, and they were 50 stocks that everybody, the J.P. Morgan bought every day. Didn't matter. Avon, Xerox, IBM, there were stocks that always were eternal growth stocks. And they just kept, we were short them, and they just kept going up. They never stopped. Polaroid, that was another one. And they just never stopped going up. Everything else stopped, stopped going up, but those Nifty 50, which would be something like the fangs today or maybe in the late 90s, some of the uh, other kinds of stocks. So this has happened before in market history. Uh, they eventually crack, there's no question. And to today, if you look at the S&P 500, for instance, in the US, uh, I think there are only 40 or 45 stocks that are above their 50-day moving average, to use uh, technicians kind of talk. Everything else is in a downtrend. So and yet the market is making all-time highs. And so there's a lack of breadth in the market. Definitely a lack of breadth, you know. <laughs> what is that? Uh, 90, over 90% of the stocks are in downtrends. 10% are in uptrends, but they're big companies. And since the, the S&P is capitalization weighted, those 50%, those 50 stocks, 40 stocks, whatever it is, drag the average to all-time highs. Now, that doesn't mean it's not painful if you short those stocks, uh, even if you, sh well, if you short them yesterday, it's okay because they collapsed yesterday. But basically, the, the, this has happened many times in market history. It gets narrower and narrower and narrower, the, the, the advance does, so it's just down to a few, a few names, and eventually they crack too. That doesn't mean you're going to make it, <laughs> you know, I told you. I shorted six stocks once. They all went bankrupt two years later, but I lost everything first. There's a lack of diversification in having all of your money in six shorts, though. Yeah, but I knew I was right. Okay. <laughs> there were lot. Well, you had, we just started by talking about how did I get the confidence. I knew I was right, but it was very early in my career. Well, that's how I learned. That's how I built my confidence, because even though I lost everything, I was right. And so I learned, okay, it takes more than being right 
apropos of this conversation, makes a lot more, it takes a lot more than just being right. You have to get your timing right. You have to get a lot of other stuff. I always assumed that everybody knew what I knew. I now know, in, that, in those cases, nobody knew what I knew because those stocks went up and up and up. I, it was a company, University Computing. I shorted the, shorted the stock at 48, went to 96. I had to cover before that, but then it went to zero. Well, I was right, big deal, <laughs> big deal. But that helped build my confidence that I knew what I was doing, but it destroyed my confidence as far as market time.